and government has this ability. Now, obviously, in the long run, those SMEs need to look at much more than the government sector. Um, but in the first instance, in terms of providing some kind of basic market opportunity, government can do that. We'd also offer a small startup fund, um, $100 million for clean technology SMEs. Uh, that's over three years. All the costings in here are over, are over three financial years. Um, <coughs> this is a, what, one of the issues is that we, when you look at venture capital, um, uh, Nick might want to talk about more about this later, but there are gaps within the venture capital market in New Zealand. And so we need to have a little bit of government intervention to fill some of those venture capital uh, gaps that enable companies to scale up. Uh, and finally, w we think that we need to simplify the tax for micro and small business. Um, a lot of very small businesses spend a lot of their time um, dealing with the IRD. Um, the Institute of Chartered Accountants has got some really interesting and good proposals around simplifying the tax system for small business that would help them a lot. So they can spend more time um, turning great ideas into markets rather than filling out forms. <coughs> the next one is driving innovation. Um, if we're going to make this transition, then we need to drive green innovation. Um, and that has to be absolutely um, essential, that we, that we drive innovation right across the, the economy. So what, if you look at our spending on research and development, um, this is New Zealand over here. Um, so you can see within the OECD, we're, we're right down the bottom. 1.31% uh, of GDP combined um, government and private sector R&D spending. And this is your um, OECD average up here. Um, over 2%. So we are way behind the eight ball in terms of R&D spending. And, and if we stay down here, um, we are not going to make the, the invest in the kind of innovation that we need. Um, so it's quite critical we improve that. So we're proposing a boost in government spending over three years of $1 billion um, in R&D. Now, that would be, wh whether that's delivered through tax credits or whether through grants, um, we, we're kind of agnostic, let's just be practical about the best way to deliver it, because um, I know that Labor and National have got different views about how that should be delivered, but the key thing is to make sure that it is delivered and that it's matched to private sector investment as well. <coughs> we also need to ramp up standards. Um, one of the ways that we've seen driving innovation across the world has been to improve standards. I mean, California has probably been the leader in this. By improving energy efficiency standards, they've been driving up innovation. Um, the OECD report uh, about innovation and green technology pointed particularly to the role of standards in terms of driving innovation. So the fifth area is regulation, and making sure that we have smarter regulation and consistent regulation. And um, the PricewaterhouseCoopers um, survey of CEOs, what they found was that CEOs are looking for clear, consistent government policy. Um, so not the kind of delay and prevarication that we've seen in New Zealand uh, just recently around um, climate change. Um, we need consistent policy about it. Um, so whether that's very consistent policy around water, um, or whether it's around minimum energy performance standards, and associated with that, of course, is the average fuel efficiency standards, we need smart regulation that sits behind all of this and provides a consistent driver to green innovation. The sixth thing is getting the price right. Um, it's hard to underestimate how important it is to get prices right. I mean, governments can do all sorts of things. Governments can have interventions here, there, and everywhere. Um, but actually, economies like ours, a market-based economy, there are a million decisions being made today across New Zealand, and there are, most of them are being made on the basis of price. So we need to get prices right um, if we are to drive the innovation. Um, <coughs> uh, Treasury in Australia, uh, the federal government in Australia, produced a report about getting prices right on carbon. And what they said is that economies that defer putting in a carbon price actually have a longer term cost. Um, because of course, uh, the longer you delay, the, more, the higher the cost of adjustment. Because it means that you have all these investments um, that are put in place when you expected the price of carbon to be low. And then of course, they become outdated as the price of carbon rises. <coughs> um, the OECD has said similar things about internalizing the cost of externalities. Um, so externalities like climate change, externalities like water pollution, if we don't have prices that internalize those externalities, um, it, by internalizing those externalities, rather, we can actually drive innovation. Um, and that's one of the key points that's come out of all the studies in this area. So that's why we need a proper price on carbon uh, around the ETS. It's why we need a proper price on the commercial use of water. <coughs> it's why a waste levy has been quite important already. Uh, we've been seeing some innovation being driven around uh, reducing waste to landfill. Um, I was in Rotorua just uh, yesterday. Um, where they're doing some very interesting work about reducing waste to landfill and, and creating innovation and products and services that will ultimately be commercialized. 
And we need to look at mining um, and the mining royalties. New Zealand has a very low, uh, internationally has a very low system of mining royalties, um, right down at the bottom of the OECD. Um, and that means that we're not pricing our minerals properly. Um, and that means that uh, the future generations are essentially losing out because we're consuming the resource uh, and there's very little being saved for the future. And I'll talk about that more in a second. <coughs> the seventh element is brand protection. Um, brand protection, we've talked to, everyone talks about that, you know, clean green New Zealand and how important it is. Um, actually, it is really important. I know we talk about it a lot, but it, um, it's hard to underestimate how important it is. This is a, a quote from Tim Grosser. Um, where he's talking about the risk to New Zealand is that our customers will be, uh, if the brand is, to, is to dented or, or damaged, that our customers will walk away from us, and particularly our retailers. Um, <coughs> we've seen that, for example, with fish in, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, fish, uh, now New Zealand fish have been banned from a number of supermarkets because of the environmentally destructive practices of the New Zealand fishing industry. Um, so that is a real warning shot for us that we could lose market access. <coughs> Likewise, the OECD has said very similar things. Um, they've said that the, you shouldn't underestimate the value of our brand in a world that's becoming increasingly concerned about environmental issues. So we need to take some just basic action to protect the brand. That's about cleaning up fresh water. That's about action on greenhouse emissions because you know we do have one of the highest greenhouse emissions per capita around the world. Um, it's about dealing with animal practices, um, farming practices. It's actually a real sensitivity in our overseas markets, the way we treat animals on our farms. And it's about ending the destructive, destructive fishing practices. Um, that's all about protecting the clean, green, and safe New Zealand brand. Um, and it's absolutely critical that we do protect that brand. The eighth area I wanted to touch on was capital market reform. Um, this is really important for the New Zealand economy in general, but it's also important specifically in terms of green, the green economy, um, is actually making sure that we have a competitive um, capital market. Um, as Alan Bollard says here, um, in his couched language, because of course as Governor of the Reserve Bank, um, he's pretty couched, he says a lack of competition in the banking sector may have pushed up the price of credit. Um, and of course, uh, I think there's a lot of evidence that it has pushed up the price of credit. So the first thing is we need to strengthen Kiwi Bank in the banking sector um, to get competition. So that means letting Kiwi Bank retain its um, earnings so that it can reinvest them and expand. It may mean a capital injection into Kiwi Bank, though that's probably not on the cards at the moment. It means capital gains tax, excluding the family home, to drive capital into the productive sector and out of the housing sector. It means giving the Reserve Bank more policy tools so that they don't always have to rely on interest rates when they're trying to drive, drive down inflation. Um, the, the Basel III's given the Reserve Bank a bunch of tools to deal with asset bubble inflation, um, which I'm having to talk about later, but it's been covered on finance and expenditure committee at various times. The other one is um, exploring options for KiwiSaver. Uh, we don't have a public option for KiwiSaver at the moment. Um, so uh, using the New Zealand Superannuation Fund as a low-cost provider of KiwiSaver. Now, the Super Fund wasn't set up for that purpose because when you think about it, it was to be sold down eventually. But the Super Fund does have certain benefits in terms of low-cost provision um, of investment services. Um, and so I think we need to look at whether that should be provided as a public option because there isn't a public option for KiwiSaver at the moment. And finally, in if we are uh, talking about increasing the royalties from um, mining, um, one of the things that I think we need to put a line, or at least put a flag in the sand in at the moment, is about what we do with those increased royalties. Currently, we essentially consume them or spend them, and they just go into the government bottom line. Um, overseas, uh, a lot of governments have started to set up um, my reserve funds or sovereign wealth funds where a lot of the royalties from uh, these kind of mining activities have ended up. I mean, if it were to happen that there was a, a very large oil find in New Zealand or so, some such, it's important that we don't go down the kind of Nigerian path or the UK path and just spend all the money, um, but actually we do create a reserve fund for future generations um, rather than just simply blow it all. Uh, the ninth area is about making workplaces fairer. Um, in this transition, um, we need to make sure that in the transition to the green economy that we do it in a fair way, that we're a decent job, well paid. And that's something that's certainly been at the focus of the UN. <coughs> so part of it is making sure that we have decent, well paid jobs, um, green jobs. Part of it is about making sure that we have a decent minimum wage, the, the $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, and part of it is about strengthening collective bargaining rights. Um, the unionism in the private sector in New Zealand is relatively weak. Um, and we need to make sure that we strengthen collective bargaining rights to make sure that there are decent wages and conditions and also engaging workers um, actually in the productive process uh, because 
uh, the experience overseas is that you know, if you look at Germany, for example, um, having worker participation in large corporations has been immensely useful for those corporations, and Germany being one of the most successful economies on the planet. <coughs> and finally, it's about measuring. Um, <coughs> if you don't measure things, you're not going to take them into account. GDP is a pretty dumb measure. Um, it's one thing, we should keep it, but we need a bunch of other things as well. Uh, GDP by itself um, just doesn't tell us enough. Um, so the OECD General Secretary, as well as President Sarkozy from France, and um, a, a list of um, very important people, as long as my arm, have all been saying um, that we need uh, alternative measures, not just GDP. And so the Greens have been promoting those. Um, Kennedy Graham, I think he's here. Um, hi, Ken. Ken's put up a bill about exactly this. The idea is, is that you need a dashboard of indicators. GDP is one indicator, but you need a dashboard of social and environmental indicators. Treasury's done some interesting work about the social indicators um, quite recently. Um, and so we've made some progress towards getting alternative indicators, but we need a dashboard of them. Um, finally, there's the, um, the fiscal impacts um, of all of this. It's quite in, this is over, so this is looking over three financial years. Um, what, what I've, um, there's probably, there's more detail in your books rather than trying to get it off the PowerPoint, but what we've tried to do was um, look at our priorities. Um, so, you know, as a, as a, um, as a 10 to 15 percent party, um, we're going into negotiations after the next election, um, we need to prioritise about what things we're, we're pushing for, if you like. Um, so it's quite important for us that we are very clear when we go to the electorate what things will, will be prioritised to put, to advocate for, and then in terms of getting the costings together. So you'll see the costings there are pretty conservative um, in terms of the government's overall fiscal position over three years um, of the impact of these proposals. Um, I'm happy to go through, and maybe people want to ask questions about the detail, um, but it's in the, it's on page 19 of the book, um, the detail of, the, of where those costings have come from. Yeah, page 19. Um, but it, it does create a relatively conservative fiscal position. Now obviously in any post-election negotiation, um, it's not just about our priorities and there'll be other issues on the table. There's inflation adjustments in health and education, there's a bare minimum for example. Um, so there are other cost pressures on the government, but this is costing these priorities that we've been putting forward. <coughs> so finally, just to go back to the beginning, um, this is about opportunities. Um, this is about New Zealand embracing the global green economic opportunities. This is about us transitioning our economy to a much more sustainable footing. Um, and of course, behind that, um, the values that sit behind it, it's about making sure that we have a decent society uh, where people get looked after and we don't have masses of poverty. It's also about looking after our natural environment. And it's also about making sure that we don't destroy the climate system on which we all depend for our very lives. And so going into, um, going into this election, our priorities are going to be around, uh, we want to clean up rivers, uh, we want to get kids out of poverty, and we want to create green jobs. And we think um, kids, rivers, jobs, um, that's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, I think, a great, um, it's a pretty great prospect for a richer New Zealand. Uh, and that's what we'll be going into this election as our priorities. So I'll, um, I'll leave it there and open it up for questions.